everyone. Uh, I'm Chi Ding Chong. I'm just a new postdoc in the Young Institute for Theoretical Physics, working with Marilena. And today I'll be talking about measurements of galaxy bias uh, from the three-point function. So the idea of my talk is rather to initiate some discussion on two questions that I have. So the first one is our current bias model good enough to yield consistent constraint on the galaxy biases? And the second one is that we need to know the exact bias to constrain cosmology. And I think these two questions are essential for, like, for people like me who are interested in interpreting the future galaxy survey data and to understand the large scale structure. So some of the results I will show today will be addressed to these two questions and especially for the first one. So to test the, the goodness of the bias model that we have currently. So let me quickly go over the measurement of the three point function. So you can imagine you have a box of survey or simulation, you have galaxy or halos inside. And for full bispectral measurement, you just construct density field and then you take ensemble average of three of them. So what you do practically is you just count the triangles of, of your density field. And for the bispectral measurement, the result I will quote today is mainly from the paper by Hector Guillaumarin et al. So they measured the bispectrum of both DR10 C, uh, CMAS sample, uh, DR11, sorry. Another way to measure the three-point function is proposed by our group is the position dependent power spectrum technique. So what you do is you have a big survey, you divide them into sub-volumes, and in each sub-volume you measure two quantities. The first one is the mean over density, so this delta bar identify whether this sub-volume is over dense or under dense with respect to the entire uh, box. And then you use the particle inside to measure the power spectrum. And then once you have these two quantities, you just measure the correlation between them. And what you physically measure is that saying that if you are in the overdense background, it's more likely or less likely to find more or less structures. And this correlation measures the integration on the bispectrum with the window function. So window function is just coming from the division of the subvolume. And so we refer this term as integrated bispectrum. So the long mode of the integrated bispectrum is set by the subvolume size here, and the small wavelength mode is set by the k. So you can see that if the scale, the k here, is much shorter than the uh, subvolume size, then this IB is sensitive to the squeeze limit bispectrum. But the problem is that for squeeze limit bispectrum, the B1 and B2 term, are just, they just have the same scale dependencies if you have some power spectrum with power low with no features. So this means that if you use IB alone to trying to break the degeneracy between B1 and B2, this would be very challenging. And so some of the results I'll show today will be related to this issue. And so to compute a bispectrum, we can use some kind of perturbation theory approach. And once you have the bispectrum, you can just evaluate the integrated bispectrum by this eight-dimensional integral. So we take the standard bispectrum model, uh, the market we have today, so it's standard, you have product of two power spectrum, and then you have B1 uh, cubed times the F2, so this is the matter by spectrum. And the second term, you have B1 squared times B2, the nonlinear bias term. And the third one, you have the non-local bias, so you have B1 squared times BS2 with the, the non-local bias kernel. And in most of the talk, I will assume that the bias is local in Lagrangian space. So this means that the non-local bias is not a free parameter, it can be expressed in terms of B1, but the one slide I will show today is that uh, we don't assume uh, the non-local bias to be a Lagrangian, in a local in Lagrangian space. So this is the leading order bispectrum model, and to take more nonlinear effect into account, you can replace the standard F2 with some like uh, effective kernel, so you fit many fitting parameters, so there are nine fitting parameters you fit to uh, embody simulations. So this is some kind of phenological model. And you can also replace the linear power spectrum with nonlinear power spectrum. And so also this is the bispectrum model in real space. So in redshift space, you just replace the kernel with including extra terms like G2, which is coming from velocity divergence, and also linear fingers of God. So this is the changing of the coordinate between real and redshift space. So it's qu quite lengthy, so I don't write them down here. So to test the goodness of the bias model, the first thing we do is to measure the bias spectrum of different halo matter components. So we use, uh, we do this test for 160 simulations of lambda helium cosmology and a very big sub, uh, uh, simulation box, 2.4 gigaparsec cube. We divide a sub volume, uh, we divide a big box into smaller sub volume. In the first case, we measure the auto matter power spectrum in the sub volume 
and cross correlate with the halo uh, over density, long wavelength over density. In the second case, we measure the matter halo cross spectrum in the sub volume and cross correlate with matter long wavelength density. So in both cases, you only have one halo field, but in the first one, if you write, uh, you can see here matter matter halo. So the, the third one re uh, refers to the long wavelength mode. So in the second case is and just the MHM. And using the bias model that I just presented, you can just write it down uh, very straightforwardly, getting two components here. So you have this all linear combination of B1, B2, and BS2. And B1 term are the same for MMH and MHM, but the B2 and BS2 are different. So let me show you the scale dependencies for different components. Uh, so this assumes that the subvolume size is 600 megaparsecs. And the black line here is the, the B1 term, so standard uh, uh, matter bispectrum. The red and blue line shows the B2 contribution. And you can see that the, for the MHM term, the B2 is quite constant, especially on small scale. And this is something you can just derive in the squeeze limit. So if you take your case much smaller than the subvolume size, and then you normalize by the matter power spectrum and sigma L squared, this is just what you would get. So if you compare the difference between the blue line and black line here, you find that the difference is smaller compared to the red line and black line. So this means that if you ignore the tidal contribution, you just use MMH or MHM to constrain bias. It would be, uh, the constraint would be much worse for MHM because the difference is smaller compared to the red line. And some result I will show later will reflect this fact. And also uh, the yellow and green line shows the tidal uh, contribution from MHM and MMH. And it seems that, the, so for the MHM field, the tidal doesn't contribute much because it's small scale. But the, for the long wavelength mode, the, the tidal field contribution is much larger here, especially on large scale. So this is not in the squeeze limit. This is rather like an equilateral shape of the bispectrum. So we take this uh, components and fit to the, yes. So this one, I think for tidal field, you can just show that in the squeeze limit, they don't contribute much. But for, uh, for the nonlinear bias, I think, because uh, it's density square, and you get different combination of long modes and short modes, and this is just what you get. But if you consider the whole halo, halo, halo uh, by spectrum, then you should get exactly the same as this. Which is probably the, the feature will sli be slightly different, but uh, yeah. So, but this is like matter, matter, halo, so they have just have different scale dependencies. I'm sorry? Um, I'm not sure if it's because of angular average, because it's B2. Yeah. Yeah. So we just take those model and fit to the measurement from simulation. So this is the measurement for matter matter halo. So halo being the long wavelength mode and matter halo matter. So halo being the short wavelength mode. The data points are measurement and the red line is fitting MMH only. So the bias parameter is from MMH only and the blue lines for join fit MMH and MHM. And the bottom panel is the same. It's just for matter halo matter. So you can see that the, so first the this is the summary of the bias that we fit from 160 simulations. So as I said, the scale dependencies for MMA, MHM is for the B1 and B2 term are very similar. So we get very bad constraint on, on huge discrepancy between B1 and B2. Uh, and, but still, they, the summary of the fitted B1 and B2 is like listed here. So broadly speaking, although it's very hard to draw any conclusion because the error bar is very large, but broadly speaking, the, the B, B1 are in good agreement, but there are some difference between the, the B2 uh, for, for the individual fit and joint fit. And this result, uh, for this model, I assume it's only effective uh, kernel with nonlinear uh, power spectrum, and I don't put the non-local bias. So if I put the non-local bias in, you, let me just flash back and forth, you see that the most effect, it doesn't change the, the fitted bias much, but the most effect is coming from bringing this black line down. 
So it actually helps the fit uh, for the MMH because the uh, the halo matter uh, matter halo title term has larger contribution, especially on this scale. So it seems that the I think the non-local bias is important to to be put into the uh, halo bias spectrum to get a like a better fit to both the uh, embody measurement and also get agreement between the blue and green line. So similar result you can see is from, so this is just for smaller size of the sub-volume, 300 megaparsec, and the error, statistical error becomes smaller. And this one is without uh, non-local bias, and if you put it back, it gets better fit. And for here, I assume the non-local bias is local in Lagrangian space, so you just fit B1. The second test we can do to the for the bispectral model is just to fit different triangle shapes and see if we get consistent B1 or B2. And this result is from the uh, Guillaume Marine's paper. So first they fit the bispectrum of two triangle types. The first one is the green line, it's K1 equals to K2, and let K3 varies according to the angle. And the green, uh, the red line is K1 equals to 28K2, and again, let K3 varies. And blue line is just a combined uh, green and, and red line. You can see that as a, so they set a K-max, so making sure that all K1, K2, K3 are smaller than this K-max. You can see that the agreement is for both B1 and B2 is good for all three lines on larger scale. But once you go in pushing to smaller scale, then you start to see some difference. So this doesn't mean that the bias model is not good. Maybe just the nonlinearity in the bias spectrum is not modeled well, but um, especially in the future survey, we want to get more modes, right? You will say no modes should be left behind. <laughs> so we need to, yeah, probably if we want to go to a smaller scale, then we need to get a better bispectrum model, either a bias model or just the matter bispectrum. So I think another interesting test is uh, another way to measure bispectrum. So this results from Schmidt et al. So what they do is they correlate the density square term, so density square or shift term or tidal term with another halo. So you can see that on left hand side in the, in the in the ensemble average. So these are all like something like density square, and you correlate density square with another density. You get you get a three point function. And what this I think this is interesting because all these three terms are essentially probing different triangles of the bi spectrum. So you can fit them individually to your halo 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 bi spectrum and see uh, effect on the bias. So it's so the green line is for tidal, the red, li red line is for uh, the shift term, and blue line is for the density square. So it seems that the tidal term always gives you smaller B1 and somewhat higher B2 and, and non-local bias. So uh, again, the error bar is very large to draw any conclusion, but I think it would be interesting to use this kind of statistics to maybe improve our bias model depending on their shape. So final test on the, the, the goodness of the, the bispectral model is the real space versus redshift space. So again, this results from Hector's, uh, Hector's paper. So green line is the real space, and red line is the redshift space. You can see that the, uh, for B1, it agrees pretty well that across a pretty large range of Kmax. But for B2, it's already very different on, on large scale. But again, this is Erebus large. So again, it's very hard to draw any conclusion. But something may be wrong for redshift space model. So in this model, they just use some, uh, they use the standard redshift space kernel and replace every standard kernel with effective kernel. And I think they also include some Lorentzian profile in the, in front of bispectrum and also power spectrum. And we also do this using the position dependent power spectrum technique. Uh, so this one is only sensitive to the squeeze limit bispectrum. And we get, also get some concern on B1 and B2. So Using this alone is hard, so we jointly fit three-point and two-point function. So broadly speaking, the B2 agrees well in real and redshift space, but error bar is too large to say anything. So they are probing different shapes. So this is something we can further test our understanding of the bias model. And finally, I want just want to quickly talk about the degeneracy between bias and cosmological parameters. So again, this results from Hector's paper. And they, what they did here is they combine, they jointly fit the power spectrum and bi spectrum monopole. So bi spectrum monopole is just you anchor, uh, you average all the orientation of your triangle with the same shape. And the parameter they fit is B1, B2, sigma AF. So F is growth rate and sigma P and, and 
and sigma b. So these are the, the line of uh, the finger of God uh, parameter in the Lorenzian profile. So you can see pretty large degeneracy between the bias parameter, especially with sigma a. So if you just assume some kind of power law, you fit to the power index, this is what you get. So you get some very strange combination, so b2 to 0.3 times sigma a, or in the other combination. So it's, I guess it's hard to derive an exact uh, num in power index here because in ratio space, the kernel is pretty complicated. So this uh, number probably would depends on your k-max and, uh, and the triangle shape you're using. But at least it seems that it doesn't, for sigma a, it, it's not th that sensitive to b2. So maybe it's, uh, marginalizing over b2 is not too bad, but it would be interesting just to give a test on different k-max or even different triangle shapes. So I'll just put my summary here since, yeah, I'm saying already all of this, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>